Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The brothers and sisters who are outside, the, the, who are attending the second session, please can you come inside? Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah wahdahu wa sallallahu wa sallama ala man la nabiyya ba'dahu wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his bestowment upon us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah to bless us all as well. My beloved brothers and sisters, this is the second session that we are having uh, of what we termed the meet and greet. The idea was to at close proximity, uh, meet one another and see one another with the purpose of uh, getting to know, you know, the, the, the Muslim Ummah from close proximity and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a success. Uh, as you know, I am involved in disseminating the teachings of Islam as best as I can to the Ummah at large. And uh, we are human beings, we do have uh, times you know, when we err, and we do make mistakes as well. And for this reason, it's very important for us to be corrected, even as scholars. Sometimes people feel that you know the scholars should not be corrected, they know they are sinless and infallible. That is not an Islamic belief. Besides the prophets uh, who were granted protection by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all need to be corrected and we need to be told and none of us can believe for a moment that he or she is perfect. Uh, we just had an, a warm session with some of the brothers and sisters just before you. Uh, what I will do is inshallah, we will have to say a few words and then I will give you a time to ask questions or uh, to say something. The reason why I'd like to give you a little bit more time to say things than for me to speak is because you hear me speaking all the time. But we don't hear you speak. And so we, we don't uh, have a lot of scholars who will give you a direct opportunity to fire questions uh, or to meet them in this manner. Like I told the previous group that this is a pilot project. It's the first time I know of a scholar who has had an invite known as a meet and greet where we have brothers and sisters who come through uh, in order to just meet and perhaps to say a few words. So I will say a few words of advice which will be firstly relevant to myself and then everyone else. And I like to say that always. The reason is we're getting across to human beings just like me. You know, if, if I have five fingers, so do you. Uh, if I have two eyes, so do you. You know, it's not like the, uh, the guy who says, did you see that man? He says, which man? He says, the guy with the eyes. He says, well, we've all got eyes. You know? Or someone says, did you see that woman? He says, yeah, the, you know, the one with the lips. Wow, they've all got lips, mashallah. Not only they, we, mashallah. So we, we cannot describe one another with something we, we all have in common because that would not distinguish us. At the same time, what we need to know is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with something major in common and that is the deen. That's what brings us together here today. You know, I am a person who, who, who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are all people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, the brothers and sisters before you, they were part of a pilot project, which means we wanted to see how it went. I didn't know how it would go. There was a lot of anxiety, uh, a lot of uh, concern. How will it go? You know, will there be hooliganism? Will there be, uh, you know, people who might not be able to uh, control themselves and so on? And inshallah, it went very well. The first session went extremely well. Uh, perhaps time-wise, we stretched it a little bit longer than we expected. I didn't know it would take so long to actually shake hands. <laughs> but it does. It does take quite long. And mashallah. So, uh, I will allow you, inshallah, to say things, and please, you don't have to be shy to say things, but at the same time, respectfully, we can say whatever we have to. What I'd like to say is, the message I have for you this morning, or should I say this afternoon, let's never lose hope in the mercy of the Maker. Every one of us goes through trials. Nobody can say, I don't have a trial, I don't have difficulties in my life. 
every one of us has issues, or should I say difficulties, uh, sometimes calamities, sometimes major problems, sometimes little problems that we make big. Let's never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. The whole reason we are here is for Allah to test us so that we can achieve paradise. It's a fact. So we're, we've been beautifully put in the world where we enjoy it, and at the same time we're preparing for the Akhirah. It's like going to a university that you really love, and you're still getting your degree, mashallah. I hope you understood that. You're going to a university, wow, the accommodation is five star, you know, the food is awesome, the people are great, and I'm still going to become a big doctor, mashallah. So that's a plus point. Unlike people who go to a varsity they don't like, and you know, it's really terrible. And on top of that, they might or might not graduate. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who can graduate and who can achieve Jannah and Paradise. Why I chose to say to you something slightly different from what was said to those before you is because I'm sure you'll get to know what was said to them. If not now, then sometime in the future. You probably will find it you know, on, on YouTube or somewhere. Uh, so there's no point in repeating the same thing. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah because Shaitan's aim is to make us lose hope in the mercy of Allah to the degree that we become despondent. We become despondent. And this is why Allah says, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله O my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Allah will forgive all your sins. Nobody, never, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter what your background is, Nobody can ever say for a moment, Allah will not forgive me. Allah will not forgive me. You know the famous story that is mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah of a man who had killed 99 people. And he went and he asked some pious man that, is there any hope for me? And he said, no, not for you, no hope, no hope. 99, no hope. So that man was so upset, he, he destroyed him, making it 100. Now there were 100 people. And then he went correctly asking, is there hope? He was told, yes, for as long as you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for as long as you turn to your maker, Allah will forgive you. That's, that's a hadith on its own. The only, point I'm, the only point I'm trying to make from that hadith is, I don't think we are murderers sitting here. I don't, anyone murdered anyone? Please put up your hand. <laughs> MashaAllah. I don't think you will get that. So the truth is, uh, we need to uh, be thankful that Allah has created His mercy. Imagine. We need to be thankful that mercy, in fact, is, is a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mercy is a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. It was simple for, for us to be taught uh, in the name of Allah, most severe in punishing. It was simple for us to be taught that. But no, we were taught in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. So nobody is useless, nobody is a write-off, nobody is beyond repair. Every single person is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is waiting for us to turn to Him. So much so that the hadith describes the happiness of Allah. When a person turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah becomes so happy that it is amazing, it's amazing. The description of it is that of a person who loses all his belongings in the middle of the desert. When he falls off to sleep, he loses all his belongings and his camel with every provision of his has disappeared. And he gets up and there is nobody around and he starts looking for his belongings. And he's looking through the desert. You know, in the desert when you're there alone, you start seeing this mirage effect where you think something is there but it's not. And you think something is there, but it's not. And then you, as you come closer, it's not there. So the, the, the hadith says the person, after a long time, he finds, he finds or he sees his camel with all the provisions when he, was, when he had almost lost hope. And when he sees it, he gets so excited that he says, Ya Allah, Allahumma, Allahumma. Oh Allah, Ana Rabbi, what is the saying? Amazing. Out of his happiness and excitement, he says, Oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my servant. 
Imagine, that's the Arabic wording. What did he say? I am your Lord and you are my servant. Out of the happiness of having found a lost camel, he would have lost his life in a few moments because of hunger and thirst and what have you. You know in the deserts they lose their lives. So out of that happiness, he made a statement that was the other way around. So the Prophet ﷺ says, you see that man, how happy he was. We're not looking at his statement, but we're looking at the height of happiness. The height of happiness was such that he just found something he really needed. Do you know that Allah becomes as happy when any one of you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And we're not talking of a wrong statement, we're talking of the height of happiness. Amazing. So, myself included, whenever we decide to do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gets so happy. Imagine you make your maker happy. Imagine you make your maker happy. The only thing is, we don't see it physically. We have to believe it. Iman. And that's the whole essence of belief. That's why we are here in the dunya. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who never lose hope, who can always head in the right direction. And believe me, your, you know, Allah has not promised that we will have what we want in the dunya, but Allah has promised you contentment if you follow His path. He will be happy. And uh, some of the brothers and sisters, sometimes we burden ourselves with a little bit more. You know, I have a friend of mine back at home who has a wife from overseas and his wife was very close to her father and so she got married and she came and the father happened to develop a sickness Allah grant him shifa he's still there and he needs attention and he needs so much attention that the daughter who is miles away is putting pressure on the husband to say you know what I need to go so the husband says okay you can go so she goes home overseas and she looks after her father for a while but she has to come back to her own children and she has to come back to her own husband and what happened is she started saying no I need to stay here I need to look after my father we need to shift back so it created a problem so much so that they were about to divorce and they came to me and I told her, my sister, yours, your husband and your children, first circle. If Allah has inflicted your dad, make dua for him. You've tried, you went to him, you saw him. You, they have in that country, they have a proper medical care facility, health care facility. People will look after him. Because you are burdening yourself with what Allah has not put on your shoulders, you are about to break your marriage and you lose your children and you're about to crack. Why? You put on your shoulders something Allah did not put on your shoulders. You have a brother and he lives not very far. It's his responsibility to look after the father. If he's not doing it, you can prod him, push him, make him feel guilty or you can broaden the circle. The husband was ready to pay for someone to cook for the man every day and take his food and, and to look after them, you know, 24 seven and so on. Get that facility. It's the next best thing. But don't break your own because of you trying to look after that, which you're not supposed to be, you know, uh, worried to that degree about. We're worried, but not to that degree where you can actually break up what you have. And the reason I'm saying this is many people don't prioritize in life. We don't know what is a priority. We sometimes are, are stressed and we don't realize the stress is connected to something Allah did not put, you put. Allah did not ask you to, to, to do this and do that. You've done it yourself. And this is why the Quran says, لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا أُسْعَرًا Allah does not burden, Allah does not burden a soul with more than it can shoulder. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to grant us mercy. I've said a lot. I, I always say more than I plan to say. So I think I better just keep quiet right there. Uh, brothers and sisters, anyone would like to say something or you'd like to, whether it's a comment or a question or something, uh, a point of interaction, inshallah, please feel free to raise your hand. Just like that. There is a sister right at the back, inshallah, we're coming to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, I would like to ask you to advise us, the Malays, the Muslim in this country, because recently the da'wah of Salafia, Alhamdulillah, has been accepted slowly, gradually, but it comes to an extent where some of us, especially Shabab, were overexcited and they tend to raise the issues of Khilafia and it makes the the Muslims who are not aware of the, what, what Salafi is, 
they they tend to hate the dawah of Salafia. So that voice has changed. Habibi, I, I, I would like to, uh, inshallah, specialize an entire topic on Khilaf. And I will talk about difference of opinion, inshallah. Uh, I, I hope so. Uh, when is the talk? Inshallah, we will talk about that because the truth is, you know, we have uh, not just a one-fold problem, it is like tenfold the problem, the difficulty which we're trying to solve at the moment. You know, uh, there are people who who are Muslim, who have uttered the Shahada and so on, they are trying to learn Islam and put it into practice and so on. And sometimes you have people who are practicing Muslims who utter words which discourage such people. So uh, we have... Uh, a tightrope that we're treading on. On one hand, we need to, uh, you know, bear in mind that we want to teach as many people as possible the deen without discouraging those who might not be as holy and as pious. Let me tell you something, and I want to give you this is a reality. I have had the experience coming from non Muslim countries. You are lucky you're in a Muslim country, but it applies to you as well. If you have a talk, a lot of the times, there are people who want to attend who don't attend so, solely because of the dirty looks people give them. They don't attend. Why? Because of our dirty looks. We make them feel so unwanted and uncomfortable. So, oh, oh, what are you doing here? You know? Yeah. I know of a man who came to the masjid once for Salat al-Fajr. He told me, I'll never come back. I told him, brother, why? He, when he was a very rich man, he had a problem, a court case. He had a court case and he didn't live very far from the masjid. He crossed the road and he walked into the masjid. And when he was walking for Salatul Fajr, there were these pious people, so called pious people. And I, when I say so called, I mean, let us not allow our outward appearance to deceive us to begin with. You know? So they were standing by the door and they said, Oh, look who's lost today as he's entering for Salatul Fajr. Look who's lost. He must be having a big problem for him to come here. And they said it loudly for him to hear. He never came back. So what I'm saying is we want to help people, but at the same time, we don't want to help them. One might say, well, those are contradictory statements. It's true. We want to help them outwardly, but inside sometimes we do things that really chase them far. We don't think of it. Don't give them dirty looks. So what? I always say, you know, if there is a woman who arrives at an Islamic talk, at an Islamic, a Muslim woman who arrives at an Islamic talk, inappropriately dressed. You need to thank Allah that she has a flicker in her heart. Some goodness in her brought her along. So do not make her feel unwanted. Not at all. Because your treading on the tightrope can throw her further away or bring her closer in. You need to work properly. So for that reason, it's difficult to just say, yes, you know, we need to do this and yes and this. You, you need to specialize that for a specific topic, and inshallah, we'll do that. The sister at the back, you had something to say? Right at the back. You can just pass it there. If you can just take it across for her, sorry, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Right. Um, I have two very simple questions. The other day I tweeted. Um, Whitney Houston just passed, so I tweeted, rest in peace, Whitney Houston. And I got a few comments like, it's haram and stuff like that. But, so I don't know how to say if, if, if a non-Muslim passed, or a close friend, perhaps, that is a non-Muslim. And um, it seems that people say you can't give your, you know, those kind of things. And one more thing is, um, also about the celebrations in Malaysia, we're a multicultural uh, country and we have Christmas and we have Chinese New Year. So every time I say Happy Chinese New Year, Merry Christmas, and I have all these people saying, oh, it's haram, you can't say that, you can't, but I don't want to be ignorant. And as much as uh, you know, they say it's haram, people say Selamat Hari Raya to us as well. And there's nothing wrong with that, I think. So I, I need your advice on that. Okay, shukran. My sister, there's a very interesting, relevant question. Let me tell you something. We, we believe uh, that Allah has sent revelation and we believe that we should be following this revelation and so on. And we, are, we have chosen a path. Uh, and that path is the path of Islam. Uh, when the Prophet was uh, in, in instructed, this instruction about people who've passed away, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا لِقُرْبَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ In a nutshell, a verse of the Qur'an where Allah is saying that it is not for the believer or for the, for the prophet or for the, the believers uh, to pray for the forgiveness of someone whom Allah has, uh, you know, uh, who has earned the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and they even say that Ibrahim alayhi salam said he would pray for his father but at a certain point when he was admonished when he was told that you know if he has died on that condition you don't pray for him uh, what we have been taught in the sharia as a result is we don't pray for the maghfirah of these people which means if someone has passed away ala ghayr al-deen which means they, they're not on the deen neither will we curse them nor will we say they are in heaven we, we will pass statements, and I'm going to say a few which might, uh, you know, show you what I do. I have had a neighbor who passed away, not a Muslim. I went there, I said, my condolences, sympathies, if you need anything, you let me know, and so on. Our sympathies. I haven't prayed anything. I haven't said anything. My sympathies. Sympathies to Whitney Houston's family. Up to, I can say that in this platform. Condolences to her family. These are good words, English words, which cover you and cover them. There you are. The minute you make a dua for them, you're not covering this side of it. And what, when people say R.I.P., the truth is, all their meaning is condolences. That's what they're meaning. Because we use words, like I say, when you use Twitter and you say M-W-A-H, it just means hello. To be honest with you, a lot of the times, people now use an X to say, hey, it's enough, I need to sleep. So when they send you, uh, be, you know, you, you, you're WhatsApping them and they send you five X's, it means, okay, good night. <laughs> so what we see and what we, be, what we read into it are two different things. So when someone says RIP, it's a formality that we just fill in. It's, when people say rest in peace, rest, it's a formality. So, but technically, as Muslims, it's better to just use a word which is, which is balanced, which is synchronized that it doesn't appear on either of the two, you know? Especially if people are looking at you and seeing what you have to say, you know. So condolences, sympathies, I think they are better words. And perhaps we might come up with some better words that would cover us. And all we're doing is we're just, uh, you know, obeying the hadith of the Prophet wasallam or the verse of the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, praying for those who have earned the wrath of Allah is like, is like defying Allah. Some people might say, look, I don't understand it, but perhaps if Allah says, this is, if, if Allah says, this is my enemy, for example, and we say, no, Allah, no, change your mind about that, forgive them, you know. So Allah says, just keep quiet. Don't say yes, don't say no. You don't know the condition. Moments ago, a sister asked us about uh, the, the condition of the Christians and the Jews, and I said that we don't know what they die upon. Whitney Houston, I cannot say she is in Jannah or in Jahannam. Some people say it. I've heard scholars saying they are in Adab in Jahannam. Someone says Saddam is in Adab. Someone says Gaddafi is in Adab. I cannot. Whether he died on the condition he died on, I don't know. He, the people can have repented last minute. They can have repented. You know, if it is like Fir'aun, where Fir'aun repented when it was too late, I said moments ago in the previous session, if he repented seconds before that, it was going to be valid, but it is too late. It was too late for him. So I don't know the condition. Anyway, that's as far as the first part of it goes. The second part, when it comes to uh, the, the greetings of their festivities, if it is a religious festival, uh, what are the ramifications or what are the implications? Let me tell you. You have the Hindus, for example, they worship gods besides Allah and they worship the fire and they have what is known as Diwali. Have you heard of Diwali? Yes. So Diwali, people say, happy Diwali. What are you saying? You're telling them, you've been engaging in fire worshipping and shirk and I'm congratulating you to say, you know, you, you've you done a good job of shirk against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have a good day associating partners with Allah. In a nutshell, that's what I've told them. So when we have Eid, notice something that the knowledgeable Hindus for Eid uh, for Eid Fitr, they will tell you happy Eid. But for Eid Adha, they won't say happy Eid unless they're ignorant. Because you're cutting their God. <laughs> you slot and they, they will they will tell you, oh, have a happy day or something, something different, but they won't say happy Eid, you know? Happy Eid al Adha. Because 
to them they will be telling you you've cut my god you know you've slaughtered my god how can i say have a happy day cutting all my cows all the cows that we we worship and with all due respect to them if they worship cows you know it's up to them it's not up to us so for us to tell someone merry christmas in a nutshell we we could be telling them and i'm going to give you an alternative we could be guilty of telling them have a happy day worshiping jesus or have a happy day believing that Jesus has been crucified. Or have a happy day believing that he now went up in ascension as in happy Easter. And so on. So better than wishing them happy Easter, happy this. We are so lucky that according to the Christian era calendar, it happens to be a holiday season at the end of the year. And it happens to be right at the end of the year. So we can say season's greetings. Season's greetings, you ended the whole story. You did not say Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Diwali or what have you. Season's greetings, it's over. Like a lot of the Muslim businesses, they say Christmas sale. So when they ask me, what should we do? People are saying it's haram. How can you Muslim have a Christmas sale? You know, but I need to make money. You see, for money, people do anything sometimes. <laughs> so you tell them, you know what? Rather put there season sale or end of year sale something you you can choose if you sit there are words that will come out believe me but mashallah i really appreciate this question because i think it affects all of us here and it is very valid and relevant and i thank you for that have i helped in any way very very much thank you Shukran. okay Barakallah. and nadira from the philippines uh, i would like to ask about the difference of opinions because it's very disturbing seeing one group saying that these other group are uh, wrong and we are right. Uh, especially um, the issue of Salafi and Ikhwan. And I would like to ask your opinion about this difference of opinion. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, an opinion which might then suddenly become a third one. So <laughs> uh, I think what we need to do, my dear sister, is we need to discuss that in a symposium on its own. Uh, it's not going to help us to just fire an answer here, to be honest with you, because it is, it are, it's things that are dear to the heart. And whenever people have things that are dear to the heart, they, they, they tend to become emotional about it. And in emotions, you cannot do justice to you know, convincing people. So I think if you can uh, uh, agree with me that we can delay it, inshallah, for some stage, uh, understanding that you know, we, we will get to that some, at some stage, inshallah. Shukran, sister. Yes, there was another sister there who wanted to ask a question, sister. Assalamualaikum. Um, sorry, sorry, can you start again? My question may be quite ignorant, but no um, I have doubts when people ask me. They said there is a surah in the Quran that delivered directly to Muhammad. No, no, oh, sorry. All the surah is delivered directly to Muhammad through Angel Gabriel. Gabriel. Okay? Is there any surah that delivered directly to Muhammad without Angel Gabriel? Some people said to me, it's Ayat Kursi. Surah Kursi. Is okay. it true? Barakalafi. My beloved sister, the, the Quran speaks about how it was revealed uh, itself. Nazala bihi al aminu ala qalbika litakuna min al mundirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Shu'ara, near the end of Surah Al Shu'ara, He says that the, 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 the angel Jibreel, who is called Al Ruhul Amin, you know, the trustworthy angel. Uh, he has come down with the Quran into the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so that he can use it uh, to warn the people. So, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, there was nothing which was direct uh, in terms of what happened to the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, where it, it came in, Allah spoke to him, and so on. Uh, when it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the revelation we have in our hands was delivered via the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wassalam to, Allah, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it was also revealed in stages and one of the reasons why it was revealed in stages was for it to be uh, to be made easier to adopt and for that reason when things happened a verse came down something else happened a verse came down so people would remember oh when that happened this verse came when the woman was oppressed the first verses of Surah Al-Mujadala were revealed and so on. So, Jazakumullah uh, Khair. Yes, brother. I have 
question regarding Iman. Um, we do Muslim sometimes we uh, whether we realize or not, if we plot our deeds over time, we will uh, we will see that it goes up, it goes down. So in this case, uh, sometimes it's violating our uh, control limit for poverty, even So in this case, how do we Muslim uh, live our life within uh, the framework of Sharia? Uh, and inshallah, we ask Allah to uh, uh, to 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 ask Allah to become uh, one of our dear Allah, and then uh, so we do not we do not want to uh, become criminals. Jazakallah khair. Just to repeat the question for those who might not have been able to hear it, the brother is asking about the fluctuations in Iman, where sometimes you feel you go down, sometimes you go up, and, and what we should be doing. Is that correct? Uh, the advice I give you is to constantly, uh, to constantly listen to that which is refreshing for your Iman. The Quran says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ the, the Quran says that the true believers are those that when Allah is mentioned, when Allah is mentioned, their hearts tremble. Someone speaks about Allah, the hearts tremble. And when the verses of Allah are recited to them, then their Iman is strengthened, which means refreshed, so to speak. They, they are rejuvenated to act once again. And believe me, every one of you, if I were to sit here and recite a verse on condition that you understood its meaning, it would refresh you. If I were to sit and read a verse and, re and, and give its meaning, read a verse and give its meaning, it would have an impact on you more powerful than anything else. That's a sign of your belief and your Iman. So every one of us here, we have a flicker of Iman. So to once you have a flicker, you now need to kindle and put a little bit of something to get it into a proper flame going, you know, something going. So that would happen by constantly listening to reminders so much so that one of the Sahaba who told Muhammad that, you know, when you speak to us, it is as though we can see Jannah and Jahannam in front of us. It is as though we can see Jannah and Jahannam in front of us, which means it becomes so fresh, you know, it becomes so good because of the reminder. So the constant reminder, constant reminder, listen to something uh, and don't always only listen to that which, which is going to be so cool and calm that it makes you relax and lazy about Salah. Somebody only talking about the mercy and the, the beauty and you know how Allah will forgive you all the time. Yes, if that impacts on you, listen to it. But once in a while, you need to have a bit of a jolt, you know, where to say, hey, I need to wake up a bit, you know. So you need to have this balance. And I cannot force you to listen to something or to read something. It, or you cannot force me. I need to have that within me and make the time for it. You know, today, if, you, if in your workplace or at your school or somewhere, uh, you have an examination, we will all study and we will study hard. And we might even spend the nights trying to, you know, we might have some medication to stay awake, you know. Some people say Red Bull, but well, now it doesn't do anything anymore. But anyway, uh, whatever you have to stay awake and alert because you want to study, it's because you need a qualification of the dunya. What about the akhirah? What about Allah? What have we done? I think, it's, I think all of us can set aside a time in the day, perhaps start the day with one verse or two verses by, listen, by reading it, reading its meaning and checking uh, it's commentary every day two verses it's not too much I think it's something we can all do inshallah and don't get bored right at the beginning when you start the Quran and you know it's Surah Baqarah and there's a story of the cow and so on no just continue you will come to a stage where every verse will apply to you in your life and you'll find it it's beautiful the deen is very 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 beautiful you know the sister at the back had asked had said that I have a question that uh, uh, it might be, you know, a question that may be looked at as a point of ignorance. I just want to quickly comment on that. Nothing, no matter what you ask, can be a, a point of embarrassment or ignorance and so on, a way you should, where a person feels, maybe I shouldn't ask this question. Because the hadith says, إِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ الْعَيِّ the cure of ignorance is to ask. If you don't ask, you won't know. 
And you can ask and ask again and ask and ask someone else and ask until you get an answer that you believe this is the purest or the best of the answers. Secondly, the, the, another hadith speaks about haya and modesty or feeling shy. La haya afil There is no modesty when it comes to knowledge. If you want to study something, you cannot say, hey, I was too shy to ask. You sometimes need to ask a question, even if it is, you know, so-called X-rated question. With respect, you need to ask it, you need to ask it. So what? You know, it's one of those things. You can put it on a paper and send it. Don't worry, these questions are decent, mashallah. Okay, so thank you for that, my dear sister. I just thought of adding that to say, uh, you, you, your questions are welcome, more than welcome, inshallah. Uh, let me quickly read something here. It says, we all have young children today uh, with their love for that which is undesirable. You know, sometimes they incline towards certain items that are not desirable. Uh, can you give us, uh, the parents, advice on how to tackle this issue? Children today do not understand why things like music is bad. Okay, to be honest with you, my beloved brothers and sisters, whatever you want your child to do, each person wants to bring up their child according to what they believe is right. Please, lead by example. That's the most powerful way to raise your children, to lead by example. And on top of leading by example, choose the correct schools for them and help them choose their company. Once you have set those three, inshallah, there is a less likelihood of them doing something that would be uh, outside what you consider the norm. Also, you need to control the television and the use of the internet. When I say control, there are two ways of doing it. One is you will not watch and you block it and stop it. As soon as you've gone out, they're watching. It's a fact. So you cannot... Gone are the days when you just can issue a dictatorship-style rule in your home. Those days are history. Today you have to sit and engage them, talk to them, convince them, explain to them and tell them, look, you know what, there are things that... Are, come, I show you these people. Take them to a drugs rehab and tell them, you see, these people have messed part of their lives or their entire lives. And sometimes you talk to someone who has a problem and they say, look, my son, don't do this. I did this and I went wrong, you know. So we need to think up different ways depending on our, our own homes and our environments uh, as to how we would like our children to grow. And one thing that's very important, don't point fingers at others, not at all. That can result in the destruction of you and your children and you won't know why. But you were busy pointing at others whilst your own children were engaging in the worse than that. So let's not point at others and be label others and be judgmental when it comes to others. Leave them. Make dua for them if you really are concerned for them. You know, say something good to them, inshallah. Anyone that wants to ask something? The sisters? There is a sister right here in the third line. What is the best way to bring the family to Allah? What is the best way to bring the family to Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Especially the, um, the ones uh, who's older than us. Um, like a daughter who wants to bring back um, my, my parents towards Allah. Towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, that is not so, so easy, but at the same time it's challenging and what we need to do, perhaps there are so many ways that one could deal with it, I'm just going to mention one or, or two. Uh, if we can sit with them, talk to them, be good to them, I know of Muslims whose parents are non-Muslims and sometimes they, you know, you have a funeral in the home and this Muslim says, I'm not, I can't go, haram to go. Who said it's haram to go? You can go. That's you, that's your father, or that's your parent, that's your family member. If a, if a sheikh has given you a ruling to say it's haram to go, it's because they don't have a family or like yours. They don't know what you've been, they don't have, they don't live in a non-Muslim environment. They don't know. And we're, it's not like we're going to engage in the church services. That, that is now not allowed. But we can go and assist and help. Sometimes you might have to go home and say sorry to your dad when your mom has passed away. And you might have to go to your mom, uh, you know, and to see her body or to mind, you might have to assist with one or two things. I know of people who've told me that, look, my mother needs to be buried and I'm the only person who can afford to give it. She's a Christian. Can I give the money? I say you have to give the money. It's not like you can or you cannot. You have to give it. That's your mother, no matter what. What do you want to leave her without being buried? 
So sometimes people don't realize to talk to your parents, to sit with them, uh, and not to shove things down their throat. To show them the beauty of what you have. Look, if I have a phone, I have an iPhone 5. If I show it to you now, you will want it. Why? Because you don't have it. Don't worry, I don't have it. <laughs> you will want the iPhone 5 because people will tell you it has this app, it has Siri. Now it doesn't only have Siri, it has whoever you want to, it to talk to, you know? And so on. And, and it has this, and it has iCloud, and it has uh, this, this. I, I think you know what I'm talking about. And it, you give, I need to mention the specs, and when I use it, they need to feel that something is lacking in their lives. Then they will want the phone. Am I right? But if, if there is an iPhone 5, none of you know about it. You, you, haven't, you won't want it because you don't even know it exists. Or you don't even know its specs. There are some brand names, uh, some uh, brand names that we don't know exist. The other day someone told me, oh, do you know this? I said, no, I don't know. Oh, wow, that's expensive, you know. Expensive, extremely expensive. And uh, I said, well, the first time I'm hearing it, how? How is it the first time you're hearing it? I said, I'm telling you. Okay, show it to me. What's so special about it? So why I'm saying this is because a person will want what you have if they know how valuable it is and how much you're enjoying it and how, how accessible it is to them. Same applies to Deem. So if you have the Deem in you and, and the people are seeing how happy you are, how content you are, you know, how, they will ask you themselves, hey, tell me something. How come you're in such a good condition? And you know, what is it? What's the secret? And you say, look, you know what? This is what I try to do. So we need to market the product in, in a beautiful way, in a better way than we would market our own products in our businesses. So I think that's one way of doing things, the way we, we don't, without shoving it down people's throats, we, we show them the goodness of the dean by spending time with them, talking to them, being of benefit to them, helping them until they come to see it. And perhaps whenever you get a chance, you can uh, pop in a slightly more direct statement when you get that chance. But you don't just start the first time you see someone or, you know, we become religious and the next thing we call, Mom, you're going to hell. <laughs> People do this. People do this. Dad, you're doomed. Okay, Dad is doomed, Mom going to hell. So what, I'm the only one with a stamp, rubber stamp at the back saying, Heaven, <laughs> Heaven. <laughs> and I'm walking around, mm, you know. That people do do this, and this is what makes the deen less, meaning this is what we are guilty of making people look at the deen as though uh, it is something less important than it actually is. Now, shukran for that question. Uh, the brothers, uh, here we have a question, yes. Thank you uh, I don't think the analogy of the university because uh, I'm in my critically of my uh, university phase. And uh, my question is this. Uh, somebody's doing a degree. Okay, he's supposed to focus on that. But at this point of life, he gains his maturity and wants to learn the, the religion more. So he wants to learn knowledge that is directly related to God. So he went to learn the Quran, he went to learn, he, he, he's going to learn the Tafsir and learn the Hadith and Mustah and all that. And at one time, people will see that, oh, this is a good guy, he's learning knowledge directly to, to, to increase his faith to Allah. At the same time, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's performing very badly for, for his uh, uh, exams and all that. So I, I, I went perspective, you look at this guy, oh, he's a good guy, he's going towards Allah, and other perspective, he's, a, he's a not a good ambassador of Islam. No, if you say you're a good Muslim, then your result doesn't show. So what was your opinion, Shaykh? <laughs> That's a difficult one. Because, uh, I understand that you, you, you came from a secular background. So I, I believe that when, when you went to school, you also have your religious knowledge at yes. the same time. Yeah. So the, the juggling is so if, not so easy. SubhanAllah, it's, it's, it depends. You know, we had a stage when the people who, who were not too good at school, they were sent to the madrasa. You know, say, uh, you know, to be honest with you, you, you know, five A's, wow, you become a doctor. Oh, this one, uh, an E and two F's. Madrasa is nearby. There was a time when that happened. Today it's changed. I have all A's throughout my life. I think I was at the top of my school and my, you know, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah. And I was accepted for optometry in, in, in the U.S. And suddenly things changed. I just flipped and uh, we went. Not to say flipped in the sense that 
I flipped my head. But uh, what happened is, and it's amazing, it's, it's a gift of Allah. My father is very, very intelligent. He, he's the one who convinced me because uh, he, you know, I can let you in on the, on the story, okay? What happened is I had applied to an academy in Houston, in Texas. I was accepted there, but the, 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 the acceptance had not yet come. And there was an acceptance that came from Medina, which I had not applied for. I didn't apply. What happened is two years prior to that, we had some visitors from the Jamina, some uh, you know, doctors and people. And they had met me in the home, and they were happy and excited. They asked me, when are you completing, and so on. I said, oh, they, so they applied on their own. And it came through. When it came through, I had a letter of acceptance. My father saw it. My father, he knew about it, I think. He knew it was done with his go-ahead. So he, he, he looked at this and he said, you know what, this thing's come from Medina. You're accepted. It says your ticket just needs to be collected from the office here. So, and I was looking at him and I was thinking, amazing. You know, my father made a lot of effort on, on, on the religion. I memorized the Quran at a young age and we did a lot of books and so on. I had studied religion at great depth or in great depth with him. And so what happened is, they, they, uh, he told me, look, you want to become uh, an optician. What I'd like you to do is first go and complete this, and then you can always go back and complete your degree you know, in medicine. And, and, and I said, okay, uh, why don't I do it the other way around? You know? And he said, look, this is Medina. This is the city of Rasul, Sallallahu Are you just going to throw it away? You're just going to reject it? So he got hold of a little spot in my heart that uh, couldn't say no, you know. So he told me, look, go there, see what happens. And, uh, you know, if, if you don't really like it, and, and, and it's going to be a point of rejection because there's a hadith which says, إِنَّ الْمَدِينَةَ طَيِّبَةٌ تَنْفِ الْخَبَثْ كَمَا يَنْفِ الْكِيرُ خَبَثَ الْحَدِيدِ That Medina is too pure, it kicks away filth in the same way that the blacksmith kicks away uh, when he blows into the, the smolten iron. And, and all the dirt comes out, that's how Medina kicks the dirt out of it. So if you go to Medina and you don't like it there, perhaps, not always, but perhaps, you might be just being kicked out of there. You know? <laughs> so that was convincing enough for me to go there. And when I went there, I didn't ever come back. And when I finished studies, there was no chance of me going to the States. It was over, in the sense that uh, there wasn't uh, going to be a chance at all. Uh, my mind was such that that was already set to... And then I told myself, no, this is a field Allah has chosen for us. Maybe a lot of ulama, and I respect a lot of the ulama that are doing good work, but sometimes your approach is different because maybe you have looked at things from another angle. And maybe you understand people a little bit better because it's just the approach. I don't know. I say the same things, but I might give you an alternative which others won't. Perhaps, maybe. And people say, oh, why do we like to listen to you? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I like to add myself in things, you know, I'm equally guilty, that's what I like to say. Uh, instead of me talking to you, I am the holy one and you're not. That doesn't work anymore, it used to work. Uh, you attend some of the masjid on a Friday, you get that feeling sometimes. Uh, we have people who are called, the public calls them a prophet of, you know, a prophet of doom. Why I say this is, one day at some masjid we heard youngsters talking, who gave the lecture? They say, prophet of doom. <laughs> and I was like, who gave the lecture? Prophet of doom, who's that? You don't know Prophet of Doom? I, I was just hoping it wasn't me. That's it. <laughs> so, Jazakallah khair for that. You know, we really don't have too much time for these questions. I, uh, the mistake we made is if you had put in your, your, your email address, perhaps I would have answered it via email. There's an interesting question here which says, you know how lately people go fatwa shopping on matters uh, that have khilaf in opinions. Uh, they pick and choose the opinions of ulama that suits them best and uh, say what yeah, what they choose to do is still Islamic because the ulama agree with them. Fatwa fishing, mashallah. What do you think of these fatwa fishing habits? We've spoken about fatwa shopping and you know, uh, people who, who, who actually uh, do this. It's not something good. Look, the deen is quite clear and straightforward. There comes a stage when you stop doing that. When you develop your spirituality, you stop doing that. I don't think uh, people believe that what they did is right. When they're just going, uh, like sometimes say, what is your opinion? And I tell people, I don't have an opinion. I'm going to give you the opinion of the Quran and the Sunnah. If you ask me my opinion, I probably would have told you something else. I don't have one. It's not based on me. 
So sometimes people don't know how you as an alim feel. I feel sometimes when people ask questions, you can tell straight away this person is genuine most of the time. Once in a while you get a person who says, mm, but you know, uh, you know, the other sheikh didn't say that. Well, well then why do you ask me? You know, people tell you this. So uh, my dear brothers and sisters, there are questions here. If I, if I know you, for example, if your name rings a bell, inshallah, I will respond by email. I, we do have people whose names ring alarms, not only bells. <laughs> uh, shukran for that. We'll end with this last question here for the brother, Shah. Thank you very much. Assalamu okay. alaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Every week we, or every day we make prayers uh, for the safety and uh, betterment of Muslims around the world. Uh, especially on Fridays, but yet yeah, we see many uh, Muslims around the world having a lot of issues, uh, in particular in Palestine and also in Syria. Um, do you like to explain why this happens and how would you make it better so, so that it won't happen again? My second question and last one perhaps. We have many young generations here, teenagers. What would your advice be to them, especially for those who are uh, in the middle of adolescence and so on. Okay, uh, those are two very, very important questions. If the answer of the first question was as simple as me saying something, we wouldn't have problems in the world. <laughs> you know, the problem in Palestine and Syria and wherever else, and Libya and Egypt and so on. If the answer for that was as simple as me saying something, we wouldn't have those problems. I think the Muslims lack leadership. That's, that's what I believe. And if it's there, we don't want, we have too, much, too many differences of small, small things make us fight. And I believe, you know, you don't have to be identical to love one another. You can have differences of opinion but still get along and respect one another and fulfill each other's rights. We have a problem where we believe, you know what, if I have a small difference with this man, it's over. That I will fight him. We do it in our homes. We don't speak to family members for years on end over five dollars because when the old man died, we didn't split it properly. It's happening. I hope that hasn't happened to someone here, but if it did, I don't know you, don't worry. <laughs> but these are the things that are going on. We fight over small things. We cannot put our home in order, our family. We cannot love our siblings just because we have a difference. You know, my sister-in-law is very hard. And you know, I just can't get along with her. From that day, I don't talk to my brother. What's the problem? Why do you have an animosity against your in-laws? And up to today, I have not had someone explain to me why in English they are called in-laws. Why? Why does law have to come in place? You know, the lawyers and the law and everything. I don't understand. Up to today, no one has explained to me why. So, maybe we need to change that whole word and we might solve the problem. But to be honest with you, the second question is even more relevant to us. I can provide a better answer for the second one than the first because I'm not a politician. And at the same time, we need centralization of leadership in the Muslim Ummah. Uh, so you find, uh, you know, look at the Shias. The Shias, no matter where they are in the whole world, they have one leader. Finished. It's over. They have one leader. They, they, their allegiance is Iranian. Nothing else. Nothing else. The Sunnis don't have that. Their leaders are all over the world. Everywhere is a leader. Boss. This man is big boss. The other one is a bigger boss. So, so, so this is the problem we are facing as an ummah, the leadership. And if someone says, okay, this man is a leader, another thousand people will say, no, we're, he's not a leader. And so on. Getting back to the youth. One point that sticks home, I said it to those before you and I want to repeat it to you and to myself. Wallahi, your company makes you or breaks you. That's it. The youth who are here, your, your, you know, the, the, the young adolescent, believe me, if you are in the company of someone who is mediocre, you will be mediocre. If you choose to be in the company of the very elevated, you will be just like them. If you choose to be in the company of those who go for Salah, the time of Salah comes, you will be the odd one out, you'll have no option but to go. So with them you become who they are. So you know what they say? They say that uh, when a rose grows, when a rose grows, uh, even the soil gets the scent, although it's totally different, because it's with it all the time. Amazing, that's just a saying. If you go to South Africa, you will notice mountains that look very golden because the gold was in it, not, not that it's there anymore. But even the color of the, 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 the soil has changed to more or less a goldish color because there was gold in there. I firmly believe if you see 10 guys fully on drugs and one guy says, I'm the odd one out, he, he is lying to you through the skin of his teeth. 
And I had an email sent to me to say, look, brother, you are wrong. I am one out of so many who are bad and evil, and I am not. And I said, I beg to differ with you. Let's have a meeting. Let's have a it's, It cannot. You know, they say, birds of a feather flock together. And I have given an example in one of my talks. You might have heard it, the talk on friends, where I've said, when you have fish, the fish of one type move together. You don't see a whale and these little fish moving with him. And suddenly you see little sardines coming up with greens and so on. No. Every, every, the fish of a kind move together. So if one tells you, I'm the odd one out, you say, get away. You think you're a whale? I'll show you in a mirror, mashallah. So Allah make it easy for us. That's my advice to the youth. Please let us understand your company makes you or breaks you. Even if, as you grow older, you might want to delete some company. You might want to nicely, carefully, you know. Uh, stay away from them with goodness in a nice way because they are bad. Sometimes you visit a sister's home and she only talks about others. Like I said last night in my talk, only talk about others. If that's the case, you can either do something about it or abstain or stop visiting. And you realize how your life improves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Uh, a question that glares me in the face. Uh, I am a second wife. Please give me a dua to soften my husband's heart to be fair to me. That's a good question. We make a dua that Allah softens all your hearts and ours too. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us happy with whatever little makes people happy in life. Uh, and I don't know your specific situation, my sister, but the truth of the matter is sometimes we, we need certain things in life and we want certain things in life. And because we have got what we need, but we have not got what we want, we feel that we are being prejudiced against. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes the poor man is trying. He's trying. Appreciate the trial. And sometimes it's a situation where people, one person is making his life so difficult, he has to uh, pretend like he's doing more there. It's, it's very difficult. To be honest with you, uh, this dua brings tears to my eyes because whoever it is, I, I can relate to this. And I've dealt with cases of, of this nature where some of the men are very unreasonable. Sad to say. You know, we, uh, polygamy is permitted, permissible in the Sharia, Alhamdulillah. And uh, it's something that is there. But still men choose to, to go behind the scenes. Uh, men still sometimes choose to uh, engage in an illicit affair for a long time, punishing their wives and one day coming up and saying, you know what, I'm a Muslim and I'm allowed to do this and it's halal. And they want to halalize all this hurt of many years let it come through uh, as using Islam in order to just, you know, uh, tell this woman you don't, why didn't you do it properly from day one? Do it properly, do it nicely, you know, come up, come forth with it. And it's a topic that has its pros and cons in the sense that it's for some and not for others. Some people can manage and some cannot. Women, some can cope, some cannot. Uh, some believe they cannot, yet they can. Uh, and some believe that they can, yet they cannot. Allah, Allah, Allah make it easy for us. Uh, it's quite a sad note to end on, so let's try and end on a better note, inshallah. My beloved uh, uh, brothers and sisters, it was very nice to meet you this afternoon. We spent a little bit more time than I'd expected to spend, inshallah. Uh, we do have a little gift to give those of you who haven't yet received it, a little CD, inshallah. Uh, I think perhaps we should be having enough by the will of Allah, yeah, to go around. Uh, the brothers, I will inshallah shake each one's hand. If you can come onto this side and we walk out inshallah. So if we come this side, just hang on a second. We will come here and walk out. The sisters, I will not give, deliver your CD to you, but uh, perhaps if, if there can be Auntie Rosna at the back there, if you can uh, get uh, some of the CDs and give them from that side to the sisters, if you can create an orderly file, uh, you know, if we can file past. The, 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 the last thing I have to say is instead of individualized photos where we spend a lot of time you know if those would like to take photos if you saw what we did at the outside there we can have a group photo inshallah outside there if you wish instead of taking individualized photos which might keep us sitting here up to tomorrow morning <laughs> so and inshallah after that we will have Dohr Salah for those who will be present shukran it's been awesome to have, to have had you here and I think we will have this type of uh, meet and greet in all different countries of the globe. But if it doesn't work somewhere else, then we know at least in Malaysia it works, inshallah. Okay, Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum. Forgive me for anything I may have said that might have hurt anyone's feelings. I did not mean it that way, inshallah.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته